Well, we're joined today by Matt Peacock from Australia, who's an award-winning author. And Matt, for those people that are listening in today, can you tell us a little bit about your personal history and how you're so deeply connected to the James Hardy story and Bernie Batten in Australia? Well, it goes back about three decades, Linda, when uh, I was a young science reporter in ABC Radio. That's the ABC, Australian Broadcasting, not uh, the American (laughs) Broadcasting. And it's a public broadcaster. And I got a call from a public relations officer of a company or a consultant who wanted to use a program that I'd done. And I had no idea why they would want to use it. He said, for internal and external purposes for their client. And I said, who's your client? And they said, James Hardy Asbestos. And I only made a little program in those days, not a great audience, and certainly not one that the corporates were glued to. So it basically it piqued my interest. In fact, it made me straight out suspicious. And I rummaged through the cupboard, found the tape, played it back, I had to play it twice before I realised that there was just this one line where the guy that I'd interviewed, who was a a senior public servant, and I might add on the standard setting committee for asbestos, it turned out that he was very much uh, a man of James Hardy's, and uh, the line was, some industries aren't all that bad. Uh, For example, the asbestos industry has really cleaned up its act. So I got very suspicious. I thought, why would they be, you know, monitoring the media and wanting to get a copy of this? Why don't they just go to him direct and get him to say it? And uh, so I started poking around and found out, of course, that the asbestos industry hadn't at all cleaned up its act, but it did have quite a sophisticated public relations machinery even back in those days. It's really fascinating. When I watched the DVD, Matt, I saw this young actor portraying you, and there was a clip of, about Dr. Selikoff. Can you share a little bit about what you heard and how you felt when you heard those words from Dr. Selikoff? Well, I should add that this is a dramatization, so I never did have side levers nearly as long as that, Linda. Um, but the interview with Dr. Selikoff isn't quite the way it took place, but it's pretty much. And the essential thing that happened with Dr. Selikoff, who, who was a great man and also what we in the media call great talent, I asked him a question. I said, now we have uh, a lot of blue asbestos over here because of the notorious Wittenoom mine in Western Australia. And I presume we really have to be careful of that. And he just wouldn't cop that. He said, Uh, I would be very careful about distinguishing between any sort of asbestos fibre. There is no safe level of exposure that we've been able to identify to any type, white, brown or blue. And that was a lesson that I had to sort of understand because you could see in this country that people were contracting mesotheliomas after quite minute exposures to Wittenoom blue asbestos. They didn't seem to be getting the same sort of incidence of disease from exposure to white asbestos. But of course, it's always been a great argument of the industry that uh, white is safe, and it's not. It can still give you a mesothelioma. It's just probably not uh, not as readily able to cause mesotheliomas as the amphibole fibers, but it still does, and there is still no safe level, and we're seeing that now in Australia. Well, I think you coined an expression, or you taught it to me, about the ABC defense. So for any listeners, will you just clarify what the ABC defense is? Please? Yes, it's it's not mine, actually. It's David Eggelman's, um, an academic uh, in America, who uh, wrote a paper called Anything But Chrysotile Defense, the ABC. And you can see why the industry is so insistent that white asbestos is safe, because all the way through, white asbestos has been about 95% of the industry. And these days, it's pretty much 100%. But that asbestos is still killing people. Well, your book is chilling to read, and Devil's Dust is really going to move, I think, the, the global awareness of asbestos, because obviously criminals and corporations can't outrun the truth. From after reading your your book, uh, which is um, a, obviously a bestseller, a global bestseller, how do you feel the film's adaptation to your book, Killer Company, uh, has done on the storyline? 
Look, I think it's very accurate, really. I mean, there are obviously dramatizations, but on all the key issues, it's extremely accurate. It gets uh, some of the scenes in the courtroom, for example, are from transcripts and uh, all the essential points. The fact that this giant of Australian manufacturing, in the midst of the realisation that people were starting to, to die all over the place, even as a result of exposure to its asbestos cement sheets, suddenly became the sponsor of a public health campaign called Life Be In It. I mean, the the total irony, the dark humour, if you like, of that. The fact that this company had exposed an Aboriginal population in northern New South Wales where, when I arrived there, children were playing in a a pile of tailings. They used it as road fill and, and fill in the schoolyard. All those issues are totally accurate. And I think it punches the message home in a dramatic way for viewers that none of us are safe from this asbestos dust. We're all exposed to it, even in our homes, from domestic renovations and those kinds of things. And also it drives home the criminal, I would say, irresponsibility of corporations in exposing people to these things when they know quite clearly that it can kill them. Well, I think the, the mining sequence for me was uh, very tender and poignant and powerful and obviously very tragic to see as, as Devil's Dust portrays these children indeed, as you say, playing in asbestos, tailing, not really piles, but they're actually mountains of debris. So when your audience finishes this two-part miniseries, what would you really like them? Let's think about two audiences. One, the Australian audience, who's near and dear to your work, and also your global audience. What would you like them to take away from your book, Killer Company, that's inspired the miniseries Devil's Dust? I'd like them, I guess, to have about two or three messages. One is don't believe everything that you see or hear, particularly from large corporations. The second is don't assume that something is safe just because it's out there in the marketplace. There are companies and there are people in charge of those companies who are well capable of selling a product that can kill. And the third message is do something about it. Be very careful about your own exposure to asbestos help others who are trying to clean up the environment from asbestos and join the campaign to stop the industry expanding in the third world, in the developing countries where its use is growing, as you would know. Well, I think those three points are are very relevant. And, And for anyone listening in, the United States has done a very poor job. We still import asbestos. In fact, we increased our imports by 13% in the year 2011. Well, in the in Devil's Dust, it it really sh- it portrays a friendship um, that you and Bernie would have had through this entire struggle of James Hardy and making sure that James Hardy was held criminally and financially responsible. So, as you looked at um, Anthony, who plays Bernie Banton, did you have any personal feelings? You were so intensely involved with the Banton family. What was that like for you watching Devil's Dust on the screen? It was quite emotional. I'm I'm not the only one either. I know Karen, Bernie's wife, was uh, quite moved, was tearful after the preview screening. And um, Anthony Hayes, who plays Bernie's character, does it extremely well, I've got to say. He is riveting in his performance. There are people here that I've spoken to who've seen the preview of the show and they've been they thought when they were watching a a trailer that it was the real thing. So he captures him extremely well. I think it's going to be one powerful miniseries. So for for listeners here today, your life has really been dedicated to fighting this global asbestos struggle, both in developing countries and in your own. So share a little bit with the listeners about what's actually happened to the James Hardy industry and, um, you know, what would you like viewers to know that they won't necessarily get from Devil's Dust? Well, James Hardy did get out of asbestos in the late 80s. Like a lot of companies in America, in America rather, they went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. But uh, Hardy here just finessed it, quietly paid out people who were claiming for compensation and... Um, The second half of the story about James Hardy and the second episode of Devil's Dust is about a a scam that they hatched then in 
2000, 2001, where they actually moved offshore. They shed all their asbestos subsidiaries and put them under the control of a foundation and then shot through to the Netherlands where they relocated their corporate headquarters. They've now moved again and they're in Ireland. But their biggest market is in America and that's with a product that no longer has asbestos in it. They used a lot of the money that they generated and the profits they generated from their asbestos manufacture to develop a cellulose alternative. Uh, meanwhile, back in Australia, they'd left a foundation that was uh, it determined to be... Um, one and a half billion dollars short of the money that would be required to compensate its victims. And so the whole story of Devil's Dust is the campaign, the public campaign here by uh, Bernie Banton, a former employee who had asbestosis and subsequently died of mesothelioma, to hold them to account. That story still isn't over, of course. People are still dying from Hardy's products. The fund is still paying compensation, still fighting cases every now and then, I might add. Um, the board of Hardy is now dominated by Americans because that's where the biggest market for Hardy is. And I'm sure, really, if this battle had taken place now and not five years ago, the board would have had a, a tougher line probably on agreeing to this compensation deal. So it behoves all of us, Australians and Americans, to keep a, a close and watchful eye on James Hardy in the future to make sure that it sticks to its agreement. So do you think there'll be any repercussions from the audience that'll first see this, obviously, in Australia? And of course, everyone is anxiously awaiting for a global screening as well, which we hope to, hope to you know, facilitate. But do you think there'll be any repercussions from the James Hardy Corporation after Devil's Dust is aired? I think they'll just stay very quiet, as they have done uh, for most of their corporate lives. Um, I don't think uh, their name is going to be um, any worse than it already is, but I think a lot of people will... This will drive home the message. Um, they didn't know the full depth of the cruelty, I guess you could call it, or the... Uh, deception that the company engaged in, in, in the process of uh, killing what could be up to 20,000 Australians. Well, Matt, you're, you, you certainly worked for over three decades on ending the deadly legacy of asbestos. So for those listeners who are unable to watch Devil's Dust next week, I'm sure they're going to want to read a copy. And I hear you have exciting news that you're going to be uh, re, re, um, releasing a new edition of that book. So we'll certainly look for that online. And we want to thank you so much for what you've done for over three decades for asbestos victims and those around the world in your quest for justice honesty and truth to end this. Matt, thank you so very much. And thank you very much, Linda.